Gracias. Vale, pues Álvaro, yo voy a empezar a, a, la, a esta. No sé si se escuchará en tu ordenador o le has bajado el volumen. Es decir, yo lo que estoy hablando ahora se escucha en tu... ¿Sí? Vale, hablo más alto. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for making this talk uh, possible and the Spanish researcher in South Africa and the UCT for leaving us this uh, room at our disposition. So today we're going to talk about two different projects. One is the SAC study, which is a, a South African uh, project with schizophrenia patients. And we're going to talk about um, the AHES Mind, which is an Spanish project with schizophrenia patients as well. So I'm going to introduce the speakers that we are going to have today. And first, we have Dr. Olivia Woodon. She's a medical doctor and a PhD candidate in this university in the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health. And her research is focused on the contribution of common genetic variants to cognitive function in general population and in people with schizophrenia as well. So Olivia uh, helps coordinate the uh, SAC study and she's involved in a number of projects uh, nested uh, as well. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Ainoa Muñoz San Jose. She's a psychiatrist and she coordinates an outpatient program for people with a first episode of psychosis. She is a member of the Psychiatry and Mental Health Neuroscience uh, Research in Spain, uh, which is the, the group that I'm uh, working for currently. And her research is focused uh, on the exploration of risk and protective determinants of mental health and the development of interve interventions for uh, people with first episode of psychosis. And my name is Jorge Andreu Jover. I'm a psychologist, I'm a PhD researcher, and my research is focused on the impact of childhood trauma in cognition and sociocognition. I'm currently completing a six month predoctoral stay in this university and in the SACS uh, study. So I want to say at first, uh, before I leave you with uh, Dr. Awudom, that some of our data are not already published. So please uh, don't record or share. Thank you. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Jorge, for the introduction. It's great to be here today to tell you a little bit about the SAC study, as well as a few of the projects that we have ongoing within the study. Uh, but to start off with, I'd like to give you a bit of background about schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder that's characterized by a range of cognitive, behavioral, and perceptual disturbances, all of which may result in significant functional impairment. As such, schizophrenia is a leading cause of disability globally. And despite the fact that over the past two decades, research has shown that there's been an increase in the number of uh, newly diagnosed cases of schizophrenia, as well as an increase in the amount of disability due to schizophrenia in sub-Saharan Africa, there is still a lack of regionally representative data. And this is problematic as findings from high income countries cannot be generalized to lower and middle income countries. And this is due to a variety of reasons, uh, including things such as the prevalence of risk factors is different, there's different rates of childhood trauma, different rates of substance use within low and middle income countries compared to high income countries. There are differences in help seeking behavior, as well as generally reduced access to treatment within low and middle income countries and treatment protocols also vary between the two settings. So this lack of regionally representative data, as well as the fact that we cannot generalize findings from high income countries where most of the research is being conducted to our setting, means that we have a bit of a problem for health policy and planning. So the SAC study, or the Genomics of Schizophrenia and the South African Cluster People Study, is a study that's uh, a collaboration between three institutions in the USA, as well as the University of Cape Town, <laughs> sorry, and the 
Walter Sisulu University in the Eastern Cape. And the primary aim of the study is to investigate the genomic basis of schizophrenia within the Lhasa people. And the reason for studying the genetic basis of this disease within the particular population and group is not because the prevalence of schizophrenia is any different or because we suspect the causes of schizophrenia to be any different, but rather because uh, African DNA is some of the oldest and most varied DNA that exists on planet Earth. And this variation in DNA enables researchers to detect genetic mutations that are associated with disease. <clears throat> so researchers are better. Identify biological pathways that might be potential targets for therapeutic interventions. So uh, by studying schizophrenia within African populations or the genetic basis of schizophrenia within African populations, researchers might be able to identify genes that are important to populations across the planet. So along with the genetics data, the SAC study also collected extensive data on the social determinants of health. Um, enrollment for the, this study took place from healthcare facilities in the Western and the Eastern Cape of South Africa. And the study has two phases. The first phase of the study ran from 2013 to 2018, during which just under 3,000 participants were enrolled. About 50% of these participants were cases who were people with schizophrenia, and the other 50% were controls matched our cases based on age, biological sex, and location. There are many outputs from the first phase of the study, which we're very proud of, including the establishment of community advisory boards that were instrumental in developing the informed consent processes and advising on recruitment procedures, capacity building initiatives, including the training of researchers at the University of Cape Town and developing capacity for future genomics research, as well as many research articles that were published in high impact journals. We're currently in the second phase of the study, which began in 2020, and during this particular phase of the study, the aim is to enroll an additional 2,500 participants. And the hope is that this will provide us with more phenotypic data, as well as uh, increased power to conduct genetic analyses. So here we have just an example of two papers. Study, uh, so to summarize briefly, um, in this particular paper, the authors discussed that they found an increased number of rare mutations in genes that were unable to tolerate these mutations in cases compared to controls. And they found that the genes that were affected by these mutations were genes that were likely to be involved in neurotransmission. <clears throat> the second paper is about the computerized neurocognitive battery, which is developed by researchers at the University of Pennsylvania. And for this study was translated into Klotza and uh, its adaptation and validation was tested in this particular paper, and it was found to be a valid measure of neuropsychological function. And this is great because it means we now have a new resource for neuropsychological research. ...that I'm going to discuss today. So stigma towards people with mental illness is a global phenomenon. However, experiences of stigma tend to vary across cultures and societies. Therefore, it's important to identify contextually relevant determinants of stigma in order to develop interventions that can help combat stigma. So stigma can be defined as the social devaluation of a person, and it's thought to be a broad, broad concept that encompasses three main problems. Problems of knowledge, which can lead to misinformation. Problems of attitudes, which lead to prejudice. And lastly, problems of behavior and the behavioral consequence of stigma is, is discrimination. So discrimination has a multitude of consequences, all of which are far more salient within low and middle income countries where many of these problems already exist. So for this particular project, we conducted a secondary data analysis of data from that was collected during the first phase of the SAC study. And this data was for 270 cases who completed a questionnaire called the DISC-12, which is a discrimination and stigma scale. It's a 32 item questionnaire that assesses stigma across uh, aspects of everyday life, including uh, marriage, friendship, employment, um, and experience of, dis of discrimination from the police and healthcare workers, et cetera. And this scale allowed us to sort of measure anticipated as well as experience discrimination amongst cases in our sample. 
So to give you an overview of the characteristics of the people that were included in this particular project, most of our participants were male with a mean age of 35 years. The majority of our participants did not complete secondary schooling, were unemployed and unmarried with a mean global assessment of functioning of 59, which means that on average, our participants had moderate symptoms with moderate impairment in social, occupational or school functioning. So here are some of the more noteworthy results from um, our analysis of the uh, responses to the DIS-12. So firstly, we have our unfair treatment subscale, which measures experience discrimination. And we found that half of our participants reported that they'd been treated unfairly in making or keeping friends. And additionally, half had reported that they'd been treated unfairly by people in their neighborhood. And we tended to see this pattern across answers on the DIS-12, people were reporting more discrimination from people who were in closer proximity to them as opposed to institution uh, institutional discrimination from healthcare workers or the police discrimination seemed to be experienced by people that they had more of a close relationship to when we look at ant anticipated discrimination we found that just over half of our participants reported that they concealed their mental illness from others and just under half had reported that they uh, their mental illness had stopped them from applying for work. So we did see relatively low rates of reported experience discrimination in our sample compared to studies of stigma towards people with mental illness in other countries. But we do think that possibly our participants were either concealing their mental illness or not engaging with particular activities due to their mental illness and therefore not experiencing discrimination but still experiencing stigma. Lastly, and on a more promising note, we found that 72% of our participants reported that they'd been treated more positively by their family. And this is promising as we move towards the deinstitutionalization of mental health care. And it suggests that relatives might be able to play an important role in providing care to their relatives with mental illness. So lastly, uh, we took a look to see whether particular factors were associated with higher levels of experience discrimination. So we started off by looking at age, biological sex, level of education and socioeconomic status, which was measured by an asset index. And what we found is that a higher level of education seemed to protect against discrimination and older age also seemed to be associated with more positive treatment due to mental illness. So what can we conclude from all of this? Uh, well, firstly, we saw relatively low rates of reported discrimination and higher rates of positive treatment due to mental illness. And while this is promising at first glance, we need to do a bit <laughs> more digging to find out the reasons for these findings and to make sure that there isn't higher rates of internalized stigma within our sample. We also found that level of education and age seem to have an impact on the amount of stigma experienced by our participants. Um, but this is still a work in progress and we still have um, some additional analyses we'd like to conduct, including looking at the relationship between discrimination and other predictive variables, uh, such as symptom severity. Uh, we're going to take a look and see whether or not social cognition is able to protect against stigma. And lastly, through our collaborators that are based in other African countries, as well as Asia and South America, we're going to conduct a multi-site study of discrimination and this will allow us to compare and contrast experiences of stigma uh, towards people with mental illness across these settings, which should be interesting. All right, so I'm going to hand back over to Jorge. Thank you. Well, thank you, Olivia. Very good presentation. So I'm going to shortly talk about the types of childhood trauma <clears throat> that we have, what we call adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Uh, so basically, we have two types of childhood trauma. We have uh, abuse and we have neglect. The abuse, what we understand for abuse is the presence of maltreatment in childhood. And what we understand for neglect is the absence of support. So we have these five types of child trauma. We have emotional abuse, physical neglect, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, and physical neglect. So these are the mainly results uh, about childhood trauma in the SAC study. And as you can see marked in orange, we have higher rates of ACEs in five types of childhood trauma. And all these differences were significant except on the last type 
of childhood trauma, the se sexual uh, abuse. These are the cognitive domains that we measure in this project. And <clears throat> we are using a tool that is called CNB. It's a computerized neurocognitive battery. And these are all the cognitive domains that we are measuring and sociocognition as well. We have uh, the results of cognitive domains. And as you can see again, in mark in orange, we have worse performance in all cognitive domains, uh, overall in attention and in social cognition as well, the task is called emotion identification. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna try to uh, talk about the impact of the child trauma in the cognition in adult life. And in this graphic, <clears throat> we present in the emotional neglect and as you can see, marked in blue, we have the absence or the presence of this uh, child trauma type. Um, we have a uh, worse performance in both groups, but it's more evident in uh, the patients living schizophrenia group marked uh, in blue. In this case, we have the face memory uh, performance. In this graphic, we have the same, but with another childhood trauma type and with uh, the social cognition task that we call emotion identification. And as you can see, again, it's uh, worse in both groups with the presence of emotional abuse, but it's more evident in the patients living schizophrenia group uh, marked in blue. Here we have another graphic uh, with uh, the emotion identification uh, performance. So we have, again, in blue patients and in green healthy controls. And as you can see, we have a decrease in the uh, motion identification performance as more uh, number of ACEs we have present. We have a decrease over here in the case of patients and over there in the case of healthy controls, which, is, which means that is, uh, in the healthy controls uh, case is more severe. So the conclusions, well, we have high rates of childhood trauma in our entire sample. Uh, in case of patients living schizophrenia, we have a worse performance in all, in all cognitive domains and higher rates of childhood trauma than healthy controls. So what we can conclude is the exposure to childhood trauma had an impact on cognitive function but no clear pattern of associations were established, so more studies are uh, needed. So now I'm gonna leave you with Dr. Uh, Ainhoa Munoz San Jose, and she's gonna share the screen. So I'm gonna stop from here. I know, no te oímos. Mm. Ahora sí. Ah, ok. Ah, ok. Um, thank you, Jorge. Firstly, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Aino Muñoz from La Paz University Hospital in Madrid, Spain. Um, I work as a psychiatrist in an adult day hospital, and I'm in charge of the first episode of psychosis program. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank Jorge and Olivia for this kind invitation, and also the rest of people that are joining us today. And um, this presentation is the result of the work of many people. Um, I would like to thank to my research groups, AES Mind Group and AECM Group, and also to the funders of this project. And here, the main points I would like to talk to you during the following minutes, present AECM study in Spain, and 
some ideas about the role of social cognition in psychosis and the effectiveness of mindfulness in psychosis and in the first episode of psychosis. This evidence, uh, these are the evidence that support the development of the intervention called social mind that I develop at the end of this presentation. So let me explain to you AGCM study. AGCM study is a collaborative epidemiological investigation based on a sample of non-institutionalized people with first episode of psychosis in the community of Madrid in Spain. And it has an observational and longitudinal design. The main objective is to analyze the environment gene interaction in a sample of patients with first episode of psychosis, their first degree relatives, and a per sample of healthy controls. And our group contribution is a clinical trial comparing the effects on social functioning between a psychoeducational program and a mindfulness-based social cognition program, uh, social mind program. In addition, our group is now analyzing data of childhood trauma and adult neurocognition and social cognition. And Jorge Andreo will present preliminary data after this presentation. AGCM study began in February 2018, and currently the treatment rate is more than 400. 50 patients, 350 healthy controls, and almost 200 first degree relatives. This is a booklet about the study. And before I explain to you the intervention, Social Mind Program, I would like to remark some ideas that are in the base of the intervention. First of all is that people with psychosis frequently have a deterioration in functional capacity the, in, in the daily life. They have a deterioration in social, relational, and self-care abilities. And this, um, this problem are the cause, one of the cause or main causes of the disability that is present that is present in this patient. Second is that cognition impairment has been proposed as the main predictor of functional outcome in people with psychosis. And third is that social cognition is the main contributor to cognitive impairment, more than neurocognition that is the other component of cognition. So social cognitive impairment are a strong candidate and the phenotype for schizophrenia and for psychosis. Social cognition is the ability to perceive, encode, maintain and retrieve social information and it is um, defined Mm, as the cognitive processes behind social interaction. Social cognition comprises four dimensions called theory of mind, social perception, emotion processing, and attributional style. And these dimensions are frequently affected in schizophrenia and um, people with psychosis. These dimensions partially account for the deterioration of functional capacity in this patient. And this deficit in uh, the uh, domains of social cognition are stable and persistent, and they are present since recent onset phases of schizophrenia and even since pro prodromal phases. And with this data, uh, what are the implications for treatment? There are two main research ways regarding treatment to improve social cognition and functionality, and one of them are pharmacological intervention. 
these uh, res the research of pharmacological intervention have been mainly focused on oxytocin, but the effects of oxytocin on social cognition are not consistent across studies in schizophrenia. Other future pharmacological treatment haven't yet had enough evidence. And regarding psychotherapeutic intervention, those that target facial recognition and theory of mind, this two dimension of social cognition, have shown positive effects on this social cognition ability. But uh, there are more limited data that allow to generalize these effects in social functioning in the in daily life of patients. Then psychotherapeutic intervention seems to be a good strategy to improve social cognition and eventually social functioning in daily life of people with psychosis. But what about mindfulness? What is its effectiveness in psychosis? Is mindfulness a passion? It is out of fashion. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. This is the number of publication with mindfulness in the title. And as you can see, it is increasing from the beginning of the year 2000 until today. Our, in addiction, our clinical group has a lot of experience with mindfulness in several mental disorders. The effectiveness, the evidence shows that mindfulness-based intervention in people with psychosis have um, moderate to large effects related to reduction of symptomatology, hospitalization, negative symptoms, depression, and psychotic symptoms, and this intervention have moderate effects related to improvement in social functioning of people with psychosis. And some words about social mind. What's social mind? Social mind is a mindfulness-based program developed and implemented by psychiatrists who are also certified teacher of a standardized mindfulness program. And it targets different socio-cognitive processes through diverse formal and informal practices of mindfulness. The program Social Mind is delivered in 17 sessions during nine months. The sessions are delivered in a group format. And the program has been especially developed for people with psychosis. 10 people maximum are included in each group and the duration of the session is 90 minutes. There are three phases in the program. The intensive phase that comprises the first eight sessions. These sessions are delivered weekly, and these sessions are the core of the program. All contents are delivered in this session. The second phase is the consolidation phase and comprises the next four sessions. These sessions are delivered weekly, and during this four session, participants consolidate abilities that they have learned in previous phase, in the intensive phase. And the last phase is maintenance phase, and completes the last five sessions. During this session, that are delivered monthly, participants are motivated to maintain and learn the learn abilities and to integrate them into their daily life. Here you can see a summary of the first eight week session contents, practices, exercise, and fun work. And the contents uh, are around uh, cultivating awareness of the present moment, diversity of perception, coping with distress, radical accept acceptance, compassion, relationships and connection, or living in balance. 
on this website, participants can access the session, uh, the content on the different session practices, meditation, exercise, etc. Um, for example, you can see here the contents of session five, focus on development of compassion with the homework and the audios to download for practicing meditation. And prior to testing social mining patient, we conducted a feasibility trial. And this trial shows adequate rate of adherence and attrition, and non, the most important, non significant adverse event with these practices associated with the program. Next, we test social mind in patients, and this paper summarized the outcome of social mind training in people with psychosis, both acute and chronic psychosis, at eight weeks after the intensive phase. And our outcome showed that different social cognition dimension affective theory of mind, emotional recognition abilities, and attributional style. And one dimension of um, social functioning that is self-care improved and after the intervention. This change in cognitive and functional outcome supports the idea of possible synergies between mindfulness and social cognition training for people with psychosis. Before the training, participants could, new, could use newly acquired mindfulness skill to observe and identify their bodily sensation, their feeling, um, their thoughts, while they are interacting with other people. And finally, the study protocol of the clinical trial comparing social mind and psychoeducation in people with first episode of psychosis in the context of AECM research. The data are being currently analyzed and will be uh, available as soon as possible. So to conclude, AECM studies an epidemiological study of people with first episode of psychosis in Madrid, Spain, and our group is development, uh, are developed, uh, implement, have developed, uh, implement a psychotherapeutic intervention called social mind to improve social cognition dimension and social functioning through mindfulness practices with promising results. Thank you to everybody who has joined to this presentation. Uh, I think Jorge will now present a comparison between the data from Spain and the data from SAC study. And after his presentation, we will be delighted to answer any question you have. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ainoa, very good presentation. Um, <clears throat> well, um, we're gonna skip directly to the question time. So if somebody has uh, any questions, I don't know if in the chat, there is some question. You have a question, <laughs> Olivia? Uh, it's for Ainoa. Um, I wanted to know, I don't know if, if I know I can hear you. Well, if you if you come oh. here, maybe you should. Well, I know Olivia is going to make you a question. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, I just wanted to know how you adapt mindfulness-based interventions for use in psychosis. Um, like, what specific changes need to be made uh, to the interventions? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, we use data from studies in United Kingdom and chat with adaptation and chat with recommendation for adapting mindfulness in people with psychosis. And basically the main adaptation consists on use more limited 
in time meditation with these people, uh, less silences during practices, uh, reduces group of participants with a maximum of 10 participants uh, in each group, and uh, try to conduct groups by two, two um, therapists. Uh, one of them is guided the group, and the other one is um, view the development of the intervention. And this, the main points I think uh, uh, is necessary to be in, into account when uh, you have intervened with people with psychosis. It's um, very important that people who uh, work with people with psychosis uh, have clinical experience in the work with this type of population. And if you work with mindfulness, you have to have experience in the um, integration of this type in, of intervention uh, and experience with mindfulness in clinical population. I'm not sure if I answer your question, Olivia. Thanks, that, that was a great answer. There's a question from Christina, which is a uh, and she says, thank you for your, for the really interesting talks. I was wondering whether you have tried to stratify your analysis by social, cognitive, and your phenotypes when you analyze the effectiveness on the mindfulness-based interventions. It's in questions and answers. I think that's a question for Noah. Yeah, but I don't hear... Yeah. To Vale. Um, I, I can hear no. I can you repeat me? Yeah, I, I can I can read you the question, okay? Yeah. So the question is I was wondering whether you have tried to estrify your analysis by social cognitive and phenotypes when you analyze the effectives, effectiveness of the mindfulness-based interventions? Uh, we didn't stratify the, the um, endophenotype of social cognition. We only analyzed the characteristic of people with first episode of psychosis but the intervention is the same to for, for all people and the result are the result in the um, sampling all the samples but we didn't stratify the the sample we do the uh, analysis we analyze the all people were were included in in the study I'm not sure if it was the I'm, I'm answering the question. Well, thank you very much, Ainoa. And the, there's no more questions. Thank you for all. Thank you all for coming. And we'll see you in, a, in another occasion. <laughs>